I will try to keep this a little bit lively for you and uh, a little entertaining and a little educational all wrapped together. So who am I? Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, so I'm a executive security consultant for SecureCon. Uh, that basically means that uh, I'm the queen of the nerds. So I'm the, the top tier of consultants, so I can like sometimes get away with the covered parking at the airport and be okay. Uh, other times, not so much. So just depends on who's in what kind of mood that day. But uh, I've been around the industry for uh, going on 16 years now. Uh, technically, I'm a double E by degree and found myself in this strange cyber world. So um, because I'm a glutton for punishment, I co-authored a book on how to create an awareness training program, something that nobody wants to do. So uh, no, uh, that doesn't mean that it still doesn't need to be done. So Bill and I decided that was a, a good use of our time. Uh, I'm a social engineering trainer. I teach a lot of folks how to be social engineers, how to defend against social engineering attacks. Uh, so I like to, to play both sides of that. I think that that's, that's fair. Uh, physical security enthusiast, right? So I'm a penetration tester by day, but as I was looking around the networks, I kept finding these strange things, these strange devices, and I didn't know what they did, and I'd call my, my contact over, and, hey, man, can, can you look at this? What is this thing? And they're like, well, we think it's some kind of door thing. Okay. Um, does the security team know about it? Well, no, like we can't scan it because it's, it, it breaks. So we just, can you not touch it? Thank you. And we moved on, right? But I couldn't let it go. I had to learn more about this. So as I started to find more of these devices, I started looking for documentation and resources to give my clients on how to lock this down. Or, hey, this is bad. I should not be able to see this. But I couldn't really find a lot, so I started making my own. So that's why I, I tag myself as the enthusiast. I did not grow up uh, in the physical security world. I did not grow up in ICS, although I spend a lot of time in power plants. I have about six different color hard hats, including a bright pink one. Um, but I also do a lot on the corporate side as well. So I have a very wide set of wardrobe, I guess you could say. But the good thing about that is that I've seen a lot of things. Oops, sorry for whoever I keep blinding with the laser pointer. <laughs> I've seen a lot of things, uh, and I can put that into something that's digestible, um, hopefully by all audiences. So this one is written specific to an ICS audience. Um, if there are physical security managers here, uh, sorry if you're going to be a little bored, but we've got to go through the basics for the folks who don't live this every day. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about why this topic is essential to ICS and SCADA. Now, I know that you all have networks to keep up. We've got power to produce. We've got water that we need to fill resources with. Uh, you know, we have all of our operations things that have to be done. I get that. Um, you guys have a lot of stuff to do. And I'm definitely not trying to add to it, but this is more of just raising some awareness of Ooh, you know, maybe we're not looking at the system the way that we should be in regards to cyber risk or even physical risk. So we can't really talk too much about it until we know what it is. So we'll get into that too. And uh, some attacks, I think. Okay, the counter goes down, not up. Okay, cool. I got 25 minutes. Let's see what we can do. All right. Um, we all know. Everybody in this room knows that most ICS and SCADA systems to execute some type of attack, you need, what, local area network access or physical access. I cannot tell you how many times I have done audits and vulnerability assessments in ICS environments, and I bring up issues, and I get, yeah, but that's an air gap network. You can't get to that. OK. Uh, you know, oh, you need physical access for that, that will never happen, and so on. So I want to bring some awareness to some of the ways that people could potentially get some physical access to areas that you really don't want them in. Um, and we've already talked about the rest of this stuff today. You don't need convincing. Okay. 
Who here knows about physical access control systems and how they work? I can't actually see you. Okay, hold on. Uh, couple hands. Okay, cool. So you could take a nap for the next like three and a half minutes. For those of you who are new to access control systems, um, the ID card, we're just going to use a card as an example here. But this could also be uh, one of those little key fobs that you have on your keychain for the gym or parking garage. Uh, it could be a mobile credential. Um, haven't really evaluated very many of those yet, uh, but we're looking to get some into our lab for evaluation very soon. So the way that little card works is there's a chip inside, little tiny chip between the layers, but it's passive, right? So it doesn't have a battery. So it doesn't work like, um, like a toll pass, right? Because that toll pass is big and it has its own battery. The card is not very big, so it gets its power from the reader. So our cool little reader here, um, you can make it say pretty things. Uh, so when you get it within proximity of this, it will power up that little chip on the card, and the little card will, depending on its uh, encryption, if it has it, uh, it will spit out basically a bunch of ones and zeros, and that will be divided up into two pieces of information that we need. One of those is going to be called a facility code, and one is going to be called a credential number or a card number. So the card number is going to be unique to you. So that's how the system knows that this card belongs to Val. And then it assigns the access levels that I'm supposed to have, uh, as opposed to somebody else. Now, these little card readers are actually wired with, um, uh, it's, uh, I've always called it, they call it alpha wire most of the time. Um, it's not quite an RS-232, but there are about six or eight little tiny wires in there. And those literally are uh, wired into this little guy here called a control panel or an access panel. Um, some vendors call them uh, net controllers, uh, but they're all the same thing. They're a very basic single board little computer, usually really small, like a little bit bigger than the Raspberry Pi, give or take. Um, and this guy has a local cache of the access list for the four or eight access control points that he polices, right? He will grant or deny based on the list that's been pushed to him from the server. Um, so uh, if we notice here, we've got our copper wire here and our copper wire that goes to the piece that will actually unlock the door. So that could be an electric strike, it could be a variety of locking mechanisms. But that's usually the thing that makes the chunk noise when you, you swipe your card and the little card reader goes beep, and then it'll pause for a second and you'll either hear a ka-chunk when the door unlocks, or you'll hear nothing and you're standing there going, why can't I get in? Uh, so these little guys basically uh, help out the server because we can't tie the copper wire straight to the server, right? So they're sort of like our firewalls of access control. We've got one side on the copper, and we've got one side on the ethernet. And this is going to be a problem for a lot of folks later on. The other problem with this is that not one overarching organization owns all of this stuff. So typically, um, physical security will own the credential or the card management. And that's where you go and get your picture taken, and they print out a card with your, your picture on it. Uh, and they have boxes of cards, right? They're responsible for keeping track of those and ordering new stock. All of the stuff that's in the blue, um, anything that's the copper, that usually belongs to a PAX vendor or an integrator. So if you're gonna get, if you have an HID Global system, HID Global doesn't come out and install that system for you. It's usually somebody like a, like a Siemens or somebody who does uh, local access control. Like they don't sell directly to end users. So there are other rules and roadblocks, we'll call them, uh, associated with working with that integrator and trying to get some of the vulnerabilities that are out there right now fixed. Uh, so then we've got our little ethernet connection there, and I did my best to highlight him. Uh, he is usually owned by a corporate network, right? And then our server usually just lives in the server farm or if you're in a smaller organization, like under somebody's desk, 
Um, or like, or sometimes it's in the closet, right? It's just like there and forgotten because like once it's configured, it's like a lot of things. Don't touch it, it stays in the closet, leave it alone. Uh, so nowhere in here do we see anything about cybersecurity or IT security. And once the integrator rolls in and gets this system installed, all they care about is that everything is talking and the doors unlock, right? So there, there's no like cleanup checklist yet um, for each vendor of, hey, before you leave, take out all the default passwords for the controllers or disable the website, the little web server that lives on those controllers before you go. All that's usually left wide open uh, because the integrator's in it to make money and they only make money when they finish the install, not when they secure it. So the industry is uh, way behind. Uh, I'd say they're at least 15 years behind uh, regular mainstream IT. So a lot of the growing pains that ICS SCADA have experienced, the physical security community is about to experience them as well. Uh, their large conferences are usually ISC East and West or uh, ASIS, some people call it as is. If you walk the trade show floor there, the big sexy thing, the new technology, are IP cameras. That's what they're talking about in physical security. They have literally discovered the local network, not even the internet, the local network, on the trade show floor of these, these vendor booths. So, and you've got a few that are kind of pushing it to, to an edge controller, or they're, they're putting it all out there on the internet so that a third party can manage it for you. And that brings along its own complications. So we're gonna go through uh, fairly quickly uh, some of the little pieces that we talked about and how we can attack the different surfaces. Now, most of you have probably heard a little bit at this point about access card cloning. Um, that is possible to a certain extent on several different types of credential or several, several different kinds of cards. We're not gonna focus on it, but I did at least want to lay out the basic groundwork here so that you know the difference between some of these. Um, the low frequency cards are cheap. They're usually just called plain proximity. Uh, these are the ones that you'll see in parking garages and gyms and you know, like, like lower like multi-tenant buildings. So like my, my kids, uh, the pediatric dentist that my kids go to, they're in a multi-tenant building and, and they have those little key fobs. Low cost, um, it doesn't require a lot on the integrator side to be able to install these things. Uh, so these systems are pretty much installed by someone local who can just roll it out in a couple of days. Your high frequency cards, uh, a little bit different, right? So 125 kilohertz for those of you who are electronic nerds, um, you know, that's not very fast. That waveform is very slow. 13.5 megahertz, on the other hand, that's a lot faster. So we can send a lot of data and not a lot of time. And that's where things start to get a little complicated. Um, some of the hotel room keys, you know, the contactless keys that they're pushing out now, a lot of these are in this middle area here. They're high frequency. They've got some basic encryption on them, but they're really not, not, like, not good encryption. Um, they're, they're pretty clonable most of the time. Although, I gotta be honest, I don't have time to clone other people's hotel room keys, so you don't have to worry about coming to talk to me. I didn't bring any of my equipment today. Nobody likes to talk to me if I have my stuff, or they all stand like really far back. And then they just kinda look, and then they like toss their business card, like I'm gonna set them on fire. Nothing with me today, just a sans bag, you can look. Uh, and our last one here are the multi-frequency cards, and these are where we start to get really confused. Um, either somebody ordered the wrong part or they ordered these multi-frequency cards because they are trying to upgrade the system and they went, they're at proximity now, but they want to go with an encrypted solution. So they have to have both because it takes quite a while to pull out all the readers off the wall and replace the readers, replace the backend infrastructure that supports them especially if you've got multiple buildings and a large campus. Uh, you can't really just like push this overnight like a Windows patch. It's gonna take a while. So that's where some of the uh, folks will go with a multi-technology card. So they'll configure the system to accept both. 
Or um, sometimes they just turn the encryption off and they, they have the ability to use encrypted credentials, but they don't understand the system enough to know that they should. So lots of work to be done here. Uh, another quick little introduction to the physical access control world. So when our, our card is held up to the reader and it makes the beep and it sends the bits across that, that copper wire there, uh, remember we're looking for those two pieces of information, right? Facility code and our card number. So what it sends is a whole bunch of this and what the controller reads is this and picks out its numbers that it needs. Now as a security person, I will look at this and say, you know, security by obscurity, that's pretty cool. I mean, at least they were thinking about it, but it's actually not for security at all. It was by, designed by the vendors to lock their clients into only being able to purchase credentials from them. So it's a, for, it's a custom format that they sell or license to their, their clients, their end users, um, and it gives them a false sense of security because that vendor's not gonna sell that to anybody else. That doesn't mean that somebody else can't write that format. Uh, that just means that they're not gonna sell it to anybody else. So when we come in and do a physical assessment, whether that's a red team or an evaluation of these pieces, that's a really difficult piece for me to try to explain to people who don't live in the cyber and security kind of world. That it's just like a credit card number. Just because the bank doesn't give somebody else your credit card number doesn't mean that somebody with the right equipment can't make a clone of yours. Same thing. It's just like even easier. So one of the tools that we use for this, um, this was the first one of its kind. Uh, there are a lot of variants out there now for getting card or credential numbers. It's called the Tastic RFID Thief. So the folks at Bishop Fox came up with this, uh, I don't know, a couple of years ago now. Uh, so basically it weaponizes a reader. It will use a long range reader that's meant for like a parking garage. It's about mm, a foot square. It'll fit in a backpack or like a big lady purse. Big lady purse is a really great way to, to conceal that. And it, well, you know, or a big, what are those, European handbags? They're not Mercer's, they're, they're European handbags, I think, pretty sure. I'm gonna be looking for them when we're done out here. I'm gonna find somebody with one. So we take the output from the reader and uh, run it through a little Arduino circuit and it will save all of that data to this little micro SD that we have here, which is great, uh, and this wonderful little file. So we can just walk around with this thing in your vehicle of choice, let's say, and collect your stuff and then go back to your vehicle, your hotel room, wherever you're gonna go. Um, and pull that little micro SD card out and read the card contents that it's saved. Uh, the card contents look like this. And we're not gonna get into what all this means, but just know that it's enough uh, for me to be able to, to write the card. Because we've got our facility code and we've got our card number there. And then the rest is just binary formatting. Uh, it looks like that on the inside if you just take the lid off. The only thing that is, this is all stock over here. And the only thing that's added is this little piece and then the battery pack. So these things take a 12 volt uh, input. So you just have to like make sure that you find like a hefty battery pack, but that's really not an issue these days. Um, I usually get mine on Amazon. And if we're out on a red team and one fails, I can get one the next day. So they're pretty widely available. What about the reader itself, right? Like, okay, we, we've heard about card stuff, blah, blah, that's old news. Let's talk about something new. What about if we did something like a man in the middle with the reader? I mean, these are just tiny little copper wires, right? Why couldn't we just put something in between there and collect the same data? Well, it turns out you can. The guys over at uh, redteamtools.com uh, put this together a while back. It's called an ESP key. And uh, they're, they're a little pricey. Uh, it, this will run you about $100 each one. Um, but it sends the card data via Wi-Fi, so it will basically just create its own network and call out to your, your phone or your laptop or whatever you set it up to do. Uh, and we put that in line with our reader. All we gotta do is just punch down these four little wires here, and it comes with a little punch down tool. Um, I'm not very good at it. 
Uh, I don't know if it's because my hands aren't very strong or, or what the deal is, but uh, some of the guys on my team are much better at it than I am. But you just pull the cover of the reader off and pop, 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 put it back on, good to go. And this does the same thing, except now it's just going to record all of the data that comes through. So it will record every entry, every deny. And it puts it in a nice little web server. I don't think I put a screenshot on, of it. But um, then you can choose the one that you want and you can replay it. So now I don't even have to write stuff to cards. I can just wait until my team member is close or if I just approach the door and I'm on my phone and I look busy, I can just replay it, pretend to scan something or you know, lean against since most people have the, the card here and I'm good to go. And the door opens just like a chip. Some attacks don't require a whole lot of technology. Um, they pretty much print the card number, right? Remember that unique thing that makes you you? They print it on the card. So when we look at this from like an IT cyber perspective, that's like tattooing your password to your forehead and never allowing you to change it. Now wait a minute. Isn't this the, the system that we rely on to protect the access to our data center? Would you ever allow that for one of your servers or one of your sites? Of course not. So um, we, we've got a lot of catching up to do. Some of the social engineering attacks that we'll do for red teams, we'll actually just call users and get them to read the stuff off the back of the card to us. Or find somebody in physical security who manages uh, the credential stock and get them to read the, the information off the box. Because that tells me the formatting too. So now I don't even have to walk around with the big lady bag. I already got the data that I need. Now I can just make a bunch of cards and use one until it works. Request to exit devices. I love these. So it does, it's not always about cards or the readers. Sometimes we can just let ourselves in with other non-technical tools. Right, so this is a pretty common setup. I can see double doors like this. I could actually see the light from the hallway in this one means there's a nice space between, and that's what we're looking for. Between or underneath, but between is better. So when we look at doors like this, these little magnets up here are these little spots. They tell us that these are magnet lock doors and that there's probably a little motion sensor that looks like that. This little box on the inside, it makes that click click when you get close to the door. That will either release the locking mechanism or turn off the alarm mechanism allowing the person to exit without setting off um, an alert within the system. So if we're on the outside of this and I don't have a card, or I don't have a card that works. So this one in particular was to a data center. And I didn't have a card that opened that door, right? I had my whole like wallet. It was like, you know, the whole uh, accordion of the cards and I just kept trying it and none of them worked. So I'm like, okay, well, I brought my tools with me. So my tools look like this. And I love to use the one that says we love our customers because like it's just a little poke in the eye to the physical security people. Because they're usually not nice to me uh, in the kickoff meeting. They, they say things like, well, I don't understand why you computer people are here and you're never gonna get in and you might as well just go home. Okay, well, we have to try. So we're gonna try and we're gonna find out, you know, we'll see what we see. So we unfold this little guy and we make it into a nice little flag and we slide it between that space and the door and you wave it and then you hear the click and most of the time you can just pull that door open. I usually put a video clip in but I was afraid that it wasn't gonna work right because it's failed on me a lot in the past. Um, another way to get past that, so sometimes you can adjust that beam from that uh, sensor so it, it's further out so that people like me can't open it with coat hangers. So you just have to get a little bit more creative. So now you need more distance through those, that little gap in the door. So I like to use the big party balloons. So you just sort of like thread it through like the space and you either blow it up or like they have one of the hand pumps just, you know, uh, for the kids parties. So sometimes I'll toss that in my backpack too. So you blow it all the way up until it's just about to burst and you let it go. And the balloon will go like this and then hopefully you hear the click. But if you're on like your sixth or seventh balloon and you haven't heard the click yet, like it's not gonna work. You're gonna have to find something else. 
It's really embarrassing when you're on the other side and you can't get in to gather your balloons back, though. Um, it gets a little awkward. Uh, the door controllers, right? Those little simple-minded machines that we had talked about that you, if you scan them with like a vulnerability scanner, like Nessus, like Nessus doesn't know what it is. So it's like, oh, oh, I know. This is a general purpose device. You're welcome. Thanks, okay, I had no idea. Um, it might find FTP, it might find SNMP, um, you know, but if you look at this from the cyber side, most of the time these are gonna be informationals and you're gonna pass right over them, especially if you've got a lot to do, like if you're only there for a week and you're in a hurry. Doesn't have any criticals, doesn't have any highs, why would we look at it? I like to look at it, but I'm nosy. Uh, the access servers, these are either really hard or really easy to find. Uh, they're usually just a standard Windows server. Um, sometimes if you compromise a controller, you can get that, that address of it pretty easily. But we can also use <laughs> regular old DNS. Please stop naming your servers accesscontrolserver.mycompany.com. Or it'll be the vendor name, secure9000.mycompany.com. I understand from an IT perspective why you do this, but from a cybersecurity perspective, we have got to stop that. We've got to come up with a code name for this because that's just, it's bad. Um, if you don't have your own, you can find them on Shodan. If you look for words like secure or, um, yeah, there are a few. If you look at the GSA approved list for access control systems, you'll find a whole bunch of vendor names and models that you can search Shodan for. Um, please serve responsibly. We're just looking. So what if we get access to that, that server that we were talking about? Like, like what can we do with that? Uh, we could do a lot of stuff. Um, so the best way to think about the groups, and the reason I underline the groups is because that's very important. Um, kind of think of these groups, they're very similar to like Active Directory, but like a lot more simple. So we might have two access groups. Um, one might be for just general folks in the office, and then we might have one for, let's say, uh, our operations department for like substations. Okay, so we're definitely not gonna put the accounting people in the substations group, and vice versa, right? It, it sort of works like that. Um, makes all perfect sense, life is good, until somebody bad gets in there. Somebody like me, but somebody who's not as honest as I am. Right, so let's just say that our attacker compromises a, an employee workstation. Pretty easy to do. We're not gonna get into the details of that. Uh, they, they get access to the software, but they can't make any changes to the groups. But they can see who the admin users are. Or if you've compromised somebody's system, you know who their boss is. So they, they do a little looking, and they find the admin user, and they attack them somehow. Phishing, you know, O'Day of your choice, like, the, the options are endless here. Now we have admin access to that server. Now we can modify those groups. What if I don't like the substations, guys? What if I decide that one day I'm gonna call in a bomb threat, and then I'm gonna remove everybody from the substations group and lock everybody out of the substation? Ooh, it just got heavy in here. Um, and I think this is where we're heading. Um, you know, ransomware on workstations, that's easy. You know, that's, that's, the script kitties do that now. But taking over facilities and locking people out of their buildings, that's a whole nother ball game. And in critical infrastructure, I've seen a lot of these systems and they're very messy. Um, there's a lot of tidying that we need to do. So don't think that you're immune. Uh, if you're a government agency, also don't think that you're immune because I've come into some that are worse off than my small companies that we go and visit. Um, this will be probably one of the next few big things, I think, on the cyber landscape. Um, you know, ransomware for laptops and servers. Yeah, okay, it still gets a lot of attention, but this is where the good stuff's gonna be. How much money would you pay to get the airport reopened? Probably a lot. And it took me forever to make that graphic. I hope you all appreciate it. Um, I'm not a very good Adobe Illustrator user. Oh, I'm out of time. Okay, 
Super quick, camera access is you know, good for attackers, bad for you. Once we have physical access, we can do all kinds of bad things, right? We put in some Wi-Fi pineapples, or we install some backdoor devices that give us a connection out over the cellular network. We don't even have to use your network to get out. Then it's hard to find us um, because we're not at the exit points and we're not at the entry points of the network. Uh, you slap a property of Siemens sticker, do not remove on something, you make it look legit, you put it on the back of a rack or like the back of somebody's desk who never moves, it's gonna be hard to find. Uh, we target the human a lot of ways to get access to those workstations. Um, 511 is great. People who worked armed security at blah blah substation really like discounts on 511 stuff. I'm just saying. Uh, lots of good things to prevent these. Um, tidying up that system, first of all. Second of all, protecting that credential. If you're not using RFID blocking card technology, these little holders, um, you should definitely look into them. ID Stronghold is so far the best that we have found. I do not get commission. Uh, they just make a good product. And they make one that's good for the flight line or in an environment where you can't have a lanyard. They've got an armband as well. Uh, caution areas, we kind of already talked about all of these. Um, I, I don't think there are any surprises on here. Uh, third party monitored networks, uh, that's where like you don't pay your own physical security to do it. That's where somebody else does it for you. Make sure that they're coming through a VPN. Like they should not be hitting that camera or that access control server on the internet, right? That's how we find them on Shodan because it's open so that their vendor can get to it. Not good. We don't allow that on the ICS side. Why would we allow it on the system that controls the access to the ICS side? Not good at all. So um, I'm gonna shut up because I'm over my time slot, but uh, we do, at SecureCon, have a free uh, PAC security checklist to get you all started and kind of start that conversation with your management. Uh, we are putting the finishing touches on a formal program to kind of grow and graduate security within PACs. Uh, Courtney and I will be, there's Courtney, um, out in the atrium after Don's talk. So if you're interested, please stop by and talk to us. Uh, we will not spam you. If, if you want more, you can check the little box that says Please give me more physical security things only. Thank you. Uh, and we'll be sure to get you what you need. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.